So good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone, depending on the area of the world where you are currently located. Uh, and thank you for joining this uh, Inadba event, uh, tuning blockchain to enter a new era of data privacy. I'm Paula Hedbert, and I will be moderating uh, this panel today. So I'm co-chair of the Privacy Working Group of Inadba, and um, the co-chair is also in the audience, Ashwa Sello, my other co-chair. I'm also head of legal and public affairs of Archipels, which is a French blockchain consortium. Um, so just so you know, this event is being recorded and the recording will be available on Inadba platform later on. Uh, I will also ask audience member to please mute the microphone, but after three years, I think, of Zoom chat, I think we, we are used to that. So to give you a little bit of context, uh, Inadba Privacy Working Group published a report earlier this year about data privacy regulation uh, applicable to blockchain. Uh, and uh, the Inadba Privacy Working Group and worldwide experts made seven jurisdictions. Um, and, um, and I have an echo. I have an yeah, can you thank you for muting the microphone? Uh, 17 jurisdiction uh, where we study how data protection regulations apply to blockchain worldwide. So today it's kind of a celebration of this report because we have the chance to have six experts uh, that contributed to this report uh, being present for jurisdiction being Australia, Brazil, uh, China. Uh, European Union, uh, Singapore, and last but not least, the USA. So I will let uh, the experts introduce themselves uh, before we can dive into this fascinating topic of blockchain and data privacy uh, with eight questions. Uh, for, so you know, the Q&A will be at the end, but please don't hesitate to ask questions in the chat. So maybe we can start with uh, Aaron, uh, our Australian expert. How are you today, Aaron? Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's, it's great to be here. Um, my name is Aaron Lane. Uh, I am a senior lecturer in law uh, at the Graduate School of Business and Law uh, and a senior research fellow in the RMIT Blockchain Innovation Hub, both at RMIT University in Melbourne, in Australia. Um, and so uh, we are a social science uh, research center. Uh, we were founded in in 2017 to look at um, really understanding the blockchain economy. And um, we're, we're a team of uh, economists and lawyers and um, you know, finance people and other sort of social scientists. Um, so that's, that's our uh, research center. Um, we're very pleased to, to contribute to the report and yeah, look forward to the discussion. Great, thanks, Aaron. By the way, a link to the report will be available in the chat uh, for those of you who have not downloaded it yet. So maybe Sylvan. Um... Thank you so much. Very happy to be here. My name is Sylvan Eugerius. Um, I do a number of things. Um, at the moment, I'm the managing partner of TechGDPR. And with TechGDPR, we, we help organizations with um, the privacy and in particular GDPR ch challenges uh, in, in technology. And we focus a lot on blockchain um, and, and related uh, technologies. Um, other than that, I'm also founder and um, uh, in, in the board of directors of an organization called BearChain, where we connect to Berlin, Germany, uh, blockchain ecosystem. Um, I'm a founding member of Inatba, and I used to be the uh, co-chair of the Privacy Working Group. Um, and in that role, I was also one of the original authors to the uh, first version of the report. So very happy to be here and to be exchanging with such a great group of experts today. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvan, and yeah, thanks for the great work on the first report. I think uh, it was, uh, you know, a lengthy piece of work like the second one. Uh, maybe Branson of Singapore. Hi. Yep. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me as well. Uh, my name is Branson. I serve on the board for Blockchain Association Singapore. Um, I'm also doing a few things. Uh, besides this, I'm also on the board for a metaverse project called My Neighbor Alice uh, on the foundation. I'm also with uh, WorldPay. Uh, and in my previous uh, career, I actually um, started uh, an exchange uh, for tokenized securities. Uh, we got into the sandbox with the regulators over here in 2020 and 
uh, we graduated with a recognized market operator license. Uh, so um, happy to be contributing to this panel. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Branson. Let's go to Brazil with Julia. Hi, everyone. Good morning from Brazil. I'm Julia Pazos. I'm the partner and head of intellectual property, innovation, technology, and data privacy here at DSMA Azulai. I hold, hold a degree in law from the Brazilian Institute of Capital Markets, IBMEC, and I've been working with blockchain since 2016. Nowadays, I've been handling and advising many blockchain and Web3 projects. Of course, I have more than 20 years uh, expertise in intellectual property, and I've been working with uh, privacy since then also. Uh, I'm a guest lecturer and speaker, speaker in several Brazilian and, and abroad uh, events on Web3, NFTs, Metaverse, Blockchain, IP. Uh, it's really good to be here with you. Thank you, Julia. Um, so maybe Odia for the US a bit up north. Hello, everybody. Um, I am Odia Kagan. I am a partner and chair of GDPR Compliance and International Privacy at Fox Rothschild. It is a US-based uh, law firm. I um, So I am a privacy attorney. I advise companies in a lot of different industries, both um, blockchain as well as you know, tech, health tech, insure tech, and like brick and mortar companies on how to uh, comply with data privacy laws, both in the US, and we're going to talk about why that's more interesting now than it used to be, because we have a lot of laws popping up, as well as I have a pretty deep bench into GDPR, which allows me to help US-based and multinationals with their GDPR compliance, as well as compare and contrast with the US compliance when representing uh, companies that are doing business in the US from you know, Europe or other places in the world. I um, uh, really like making this topic accessible and interesting to people because there are those that say that you know, it's complicated and boring, not me. Um, so I do a lot of content on LinkedIn and I welcome you to connect with me and uh, hear feedback and hopefully you know, uh, we can interact about this. So uh, looking forward to hearing from everybody. Awesome. Thank you, Odia, and we look forward to, to read this content as well. Uh, so now, last but not least, Yuki, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. <laughs> I tried to get it right, but it's, uh, it's complicated. Hi, Yuki. Thank you for having me, and it's uh, my privilege to sit among this distinguished panel. Um, who is my family name? And if you have been watching some drama related to a very important Congress in China in the past few days, you may recognize this, this shoe name. Um, I uh, am an attorney at a private firm called Jintian Gongchen. We just celebrated our 30 years, uh, 30 years anniversary and uh, 30th anniversary. And I advised a few um, companies uh, adopting blockchain technology, uh, blockchain based technology in their business uh, in many sectors. And I also litigated a few um, pioneering privacy ca litigation cases in China. Um, again, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Well, thank you um, to all of you for being here. Uh, thank you also to the Privacy Working Group to uh, you know, work on these reports uh, with Sylvan and then uh, with uh, Hash and I. Uh, so the first, we have eight questions today, eight topics that we're going to uh, ask uh, the experts. The first one I wanted to touch on before we even go into blockchain specifics. Uh, is what are the legal acts that regulate data privacy in your jurisdiction? Uh, because we have a various audience today, it might not only be lawyers, and it's always to understand you know, what we are talking about. Um, so we can start with whatever jurisdiction, we can start again with uh, Aaron, Australia, or whoever wants to pick first. Please pick first. Happy to jump in. Um... Also, with uh, probably the, the the best known European regulation out there, the GDPR is what applies in, in Europe. GDPR stands for the General Data Protection Regulation. Um, I I guess most people have heard of that because compliance to it is such a big topic uh, these days. 
in all parts of the world. Um, what is uh, perhaps a short, uh, interesting side note to that is that the GDPR, while it applies in Europe um, uh, across the board, there are local implementations. So in all the different EU member states, uh, there are different uh, small variations uh, to the GDPR that are to be taken into account. Um, so even though it does create a, a level playing field within Europe, it doesn't harmonize absolutely everything. There's still a level of, of um, localization and local interpretation to be done. Well, I think I, I'm jumping in right now because the data protection laws in Brazil more or less mirror European Union regulations and are quite new here for us. Uh, the law in Brazil is called LEGPD and came into effect in September 2020, but there was a period of grace until uh, August 2021. And during this period, any breaches were not sanctioned. So this allowed companies sufficient time to adapt uh, to the laws and also to promote, uh, promote a smoother transition. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the law is pretty new and the regulatory authorities is still learning how to enforce breaches. And of course, to the best of my knowledge, uh, they haven't taken any serious enforcement actions against any Brazilian or foreign uh, companies. ANPG, which the, the regulatory authority, current approach seems to be much more to educate and assist companies with the introduction and compliance of laws than sanction them uh, right now. Um, I can jump in on the U.S. side. So in the U.S., the, the, the landscape is a bit complicated. We have old laws, federal laws that are sectoral that regulate personal information by topic. So, for example, um, information from hospitals is under a law called HIPAA. Information from banks and financial institutions, Graham Leach Bliley. There's also the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Um, then we have... Uh, data breach notification laws, which we have in all 50 states, as well as a number of federal ones. Um, we also have the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, which is the de facto regulator of privacy that has jurisdiction over companies throughout the US and has for the past 20 years at least enforced both information security and privacy uh, violations. And then we have the newest layer, which is we now have five state uh, laws that are comprehensive data privacy laws. The first one in California already in effect is the CCPA. It is being replaced by a stronger law in California that goes into effect in January of 23. That's CPRA. And then in 23, we also have four more states joining. They are Virginia, Colorado, Connecticut, and Utah. And they are uh, not the same as GDPR. There are some common principles. They are also not the same as each other, which makes things very interesting for us. But they do all talk about personal information and therefore capture personal information that would go on the blockchain. So in terms of the uh, Australian perspective, um, we, Australia is a federation. Um, and, and so we have a, a federal government uh, and then we have state governments uh, and territory governments as well. Um, the main piece of legislation is at a federal level. So we have the Privacy Act uh, and the privacy regulations. Um, these were introduced uh, in the late 1980s, um, really to regulate how government agencies managed personal information. And, and over time, um, that has expanded um, through uh, you know, credit reporting bodies, credit providers, uh, and now to private sector organisations um, that have got uh, an, an annual turnover of, of a particular amount. And so um, that, that's, that's the main federal piece of legislation. Each state and territory have um, not, not the, the same laws, but, but um, 
uh, you know, as was being explained in, in the US context, um, you've got a series of different state-based legislation that all looks a little bit different and all does a little bit of a different thing. Um, and then you've got some functional uh, areas like, you know, for instance, telecommunications or, or criminal records or, or health records, um, uh, workplace, uh, you know, records and, and those sorts of things that will have different um, legislation again. In, in, importantly, uh, there is no uh, individual um, uh, privacy rights and, and causes of action. Um, and so it, it's a regime that is publicly enforced by a, a public regulator. Um, it, it's not something where we see, um, you know, private litigation, for instance. Yeah, so uh, I'll jump in here. So pertaining to Singapore, I think we have the uh, PDPA, uh, which stands for Personal Data uh, Protection Act. Uh, that was introduced in 2012 uh, by PDBC, which is Personal Data Protection Commission. Um, basically, it sets out a baseline standard for protection of personal data, uh, but it also complements uh, sector-specific uh, legislative and regulatory frameworks, right? Uh, which is the Banking Act as well as the Insurance Act. Um, some of the things that are sort of set out in the guidelines include the uh, collection, uh, use, disclosure, and also um, care of personal data. Um, but I think we have also seen a lot of uh, data breaches uh, amongst uh, some of the e-commerce platforms recently. So I think uh, uh, going forward, uh, we will see a lot more focus in this area uh, pertaining to uh, data privacy and, 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 and data breaches. Yeah, thanks. Then voice from China to fill the last piece of the Pacific. So in China, uh, I mean, mainland China, exclusive of Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan. In mainland China, we have a primary law, which is called Personal Information Protection Law. We also have a complex web of laws and regulations, and uh, the cybersecurity law, the data security law, the civil code, the, the criminal law are all relevant uh, in terms of data privacy. And uh, But uh, when talking about data privacy law in China or cybersecurity law in China generally, uh, one need to bear in mind that uh, the policy focus um, is always national security. So um, that's, um, I think, so basically the Chinese data privacy law has a different, has a different gene, I would say, um, and it's, um, and it's fundamental principles and rational. Also, I think, um, uh, in terms of data privacy, uh, it is generally the consensus of Chinese authorities that the GDPR is not that successful uh, in promoting a vibrant and competitive uh, digital uh, economy. So the, the Chinese legislation tries to strike a balance between you know, the need to uh, protect personal information and the need to facilitate um, e-commerce um, with sophistication. So, so far, I would say that they have doing a reasonably good job. Thank you very much for this overview. Um, so the thing I wanted to emphasize here uh, is that we've seen that there is various different data protection regulation being federal, being European, being like national, uh, but the commonality that we can find between all of these jurisdictions uh, is the definition that we have of a personal data or personal information, depending on the country. And generally speaking, with some little variation, uh, a personal data, uh, which is a big topic today, right, is an information that identify a natural person, either directly or indirectly. Um, so this is a common definition for all of, us, of the jurisdiction. Uh, but I wanted to you know, remind the audience uh, for the sake of the discussion today. So the second question um, that I wanted to ask um, our experts uh, before we dig into blockchain by itself is the kind of actors that your regulation uh, is actually uh, tackling, uh, because regulation are important, but it's important to understand who is being regulated, right? Um, so I think you have some similarities, for instance, between the EU and Brazil. Uh, so maybe Sylvan, you want uh, to get started. 
So under the GDPR, there are I would I would say three main types of actor and and one subtype of actor. Um, the 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 first one to define is the data subject, and that is the individual of uh, like whose data is actually being processed. Very easy to understand, I guess. Um, then the data controller in the context of the of the GDPR is the is the entity or sometimes the person who is actually defining the means and purposes of of the of the processing of that data and that is actually the language that the GDPR uses but what does it actually mean um, it is typically um, the organization in, in whom's interest data is being processed um, that so it doesn't have to be collected by that entity or it doesn't have to be not all the processing has to be done by that entity, but it's uh, it's it's typically in the interest of this of this organization that that, that the data is being processed, and that's that's um, uh, then you know in in the GDPR defined as defining the means and and purposes. Um, the data processor is uh, the entity that processes data on behalf of a data controller, um, and is therefore furnished with processing instructions. is is asked by a controller like, okay, um, can you please uh, process data um, in in this in this way? That could be through different means. That could by it could be by collecting it from a data subject. That could be by by performing specific uh, processing operations on it, or a very lively example is basically any kind of uh, software as a service provider right so how does um if if i if i have a contract with uh, we are we're on zoom for example right um so zoom is a processor on behalf of inapa very simple example um and and then the, the the subtype that is interesting and that also became makes it a little bit more um uh tricky to to explain is that there's also the concept of of joint controllership it could be that one or more entities are jointly determining the means and purposes of processing so they are together responsible for uh for the processing of personal data um, and they have a, a common interest or a common purpose for the processing of the data and and through that they become jointly responsible in that last case it's very important that these two or more parties then agree upon okay who is who is then actually responsible for uh, for example responding to any requests or inquiries from the supervisory authorities etc um, so that that means that joint controllership has always needs to be done based on an agreement and the essence of that agreement needs to be made public, uh, needs to be made available to the data subjects then, so that there is an ongoing transparency in that regard. Well, uh, just like Europe, as mentioned by Sylvan, we, in general lines, we have data subjects, controllers, processors, the ANPD, which is the National Authority for Data Protection, and companies need to have uh, data protection officers. Although the laws are very, very, very similar, uh, the Brazilian and, and the GDPR, uh, one of the major differences between Brazil and Europe, to the best of, of, of my knowledge, are the sanctions. In Brazil, the sanctions can be pretty high, ranging from 2% of the monthly income up to a limit of 50 million reais, or about $10 million, so it's, it's pretty high. I can jump in on the US. So the US um, uh, is complicated. <laughs> so we have, uh, under the old laws, we have a variety of different terms. So under HIPAA, you can be a covered entity, which is the rough equivalent of, let's say, a GDPR data controller. And you have a business associate, which is the rough equivalent of the GDPR data processor. And the information is called PHI, protected health information. Um, we also have different terms under the other financial laws. The new laws um, are also uh, decided to make this uh, not easy. So under the California law, um, we have, uh, instead of a data controller, we have a business. And the business basically is a data controller, generally speaking, with the exception that unlike GDPR, where there is no threshold requirement, if you are a one man show, 
uh, company, like a solo company, and, and, and you still, and you have, you know, a mom and pop shop or something, um, you would still be a data controller and you have obligations. Um, GDPR, you know, has these, uh, the level of formality that you need differs, but you're still subject to the law. The new US laws, California and the other states, they have thresholds um, geared towards excluding companies that are smaller, with the exception that you could be a small company turnover wise, but handle a lot of data or monetize data, and then you would be in scope for the law. So that's number one is you need to have a minimum threshold that, that there are different thresholds, but um, 25 million under CCPA uh, moving on to 50 and different types of records, like how many records of people is it 50,000, 100,000. So the, the general rule without, you know, if you're interested in the details, please feel free to ask me later, but to not bore everybody, there are thresholds, right? So um, revenue, number of records, nature of the activity, meaning monetize or not. The people, the actors, so first of all, uh, in CCPA, it is a consumer, not a data subject. Um, it is uh, a business, not a data controller, and it is a service provider, not a data processor. And as with respect to service provider and data processor, I can say this. Every data processor under GDPR is a service provider under CCPA. But not every service provider under CCPA is a data processor because there are situations where a service provider can process information internally for its own purposes that immediately makes them a controller under GDPR. We also have a contractor, which very few people understand what that term is. And we have a third party, which is the recipient of the information. Um, under the new laws, other laws like Colorado, they actually use the GDPR terms. So there we do have a controller and a processor and personal data as opposed to personal information. Um, we don't have a joint controllership concept but we do now have uh, things in the new California regs that are kind of joint controller like. So you don't call it joint controllers, but for example, if you have third party cookies on your website, then the regs specify obligations for both the website and the cookie placer. So the Australian position um, is, we have these things called Australian privacy principles. And those are binding on what are called an APP entity. Now, who are those entities? Well, um, one is either a government agency or a government organization. Um, and uh, so that's, that's sort of on one hand. On, on the private side, um, uh, we've got essentially organizations which could include an individual it could include a partnership it could include an incorporated uh, entity it could include a, a, a trust or, or, or whatever um, uh, so long as they've got a turnover of at least uh, three million Australian dollars um, then they're uh, then they are bound by those um, uh, Australian privacy principles so um, that's there's there's no real distinction between different types of um, uh, of, of entities. Um, you, you're, there's one sort of AAP uh, APP entity, uh, or or it doesn't apply. And there are some carve outs. So, um, for for instance, um, uh, you know, small business operators uh, are carved out. Um, uh, registered political parties, as another example, are, are carved out. Um, of, of these laws. So it's, uh, I, I guess it's, it's an equivalent to a, a, a controller, but it's, it's, not, uh, it's, it's not the same and it, it's certainly not the same definition. Yeah, so for Singapore uh, under PDPA, uh, we have identified about uh, three um, actors. So that would be organizations, data intermediaries, and individuals. 
So for data intermediary, uh, very simple. Basically, it's an organization uh, which processes uh, personal data on behalf of the organization. And that excludes um, employees of that, that uh, uh, organization, right? Uh, for individuals, uh, means natural person. And uh, effectively, what we're saying is that uh, if, um, you know, some of these data need to be collected, uh, the individuals need to give consent and they need to be informed of the purpose of the collection of the data. And it has to be reasonable, right? Uh, and they can uh, withdraw at any point of time. For organization, uh, basically is for companies or individuals or any incorporated companies in Singapore or recognized under Singapore law uh, or have a, a, an office or place of business in Singapore. Um, and for organizations, I think they're a lot more, um, uh, it's a lot more onerous. Uh, they have to actually have security arrangement, which is accurate and, and complete. And if they collect data, they would also be responsible for the, 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 the timeliness and also the disposal of it if it's no longer necessary to be retained. Uh, and if it's transferred out of Singapore, there should be some measures in place. Um, and they are also responsible for appointing a data protection officer, what we call a DPO. And uh, this is a must. In fact, uh, there are several companies that have been prosecuted for not having a data, professor, a data protection officer uh, in-house. Uh, and, and of course, if there are any data breaches, uh, they need to notify uh, PDBC within 72 hours. Yeah, so those are some of the actors. Yeah, thanks. Uh, from um, China, I think the, the basic structure is very similar to, to those under the GDPR, but we use different terminologies. So um, we call uh, individuals personal information subjects. And we have processors, which actually means controllers under the GDPR. And we have entrusted parties, which actually refers, uh, refer to processors under the GDPR. So um, basically, as it seems that the GB, GDPR is kind of a common tone in the privacy world. Um, that said, um, as the Chinese privacy law is um, kind of mingled with uh, cybersecurity law, we also have two very important concepts um, which may be relevant um, in the on the different regulations. The, the first one is um, network operator, the concept of network operator. Um, a network op operator is the owner or manager of a system composed of computers or other information terminals and uh, which, which possess information, not just the personal information, but possess, uh, process, sorry, uh, uh, any information. You can imagine that uh, you may not be able to identify a network operator if you are talking about a public blockchain, making the regulation uh, quite challenging uh, in some way. And we also have technical uh, or technical service uh, provider or technical technology provider. And they are those entities which provide a certain technology, but they don't operate the, 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 the platforms or the systems. So um, they are not uh, heavily regulated under China's laws, but um, they, they are still relevant because they bear a certain level of duty of care to data subjects and to they, they may be also contractually liable to those using technology. So thanks to all the experts for this very precise uh, explanation. Um, it was a bit of a legal, uh, you know, legal conception and everything, but I think it was important to set the ground so we can actually now enter into the, the hot topic today, which is uh, blockchain and data privacy. And um, so a huge question that the industry is asking at the moment is, especially in the, concept, in the context, sorry, of uh, public permissionless network uh, is, do you have any guidance, any recommendation how, on how uh, miners, validators should be qualified and all the actors you mentioned before being controller, processor, organization, network operator, um, how do they actually can uh, enter uh, into function into the blockchain realm? Um, well, I, I, I can begin this time. Well, in, in Brazil, the ANPG is so focused uh, on data protection in the traditional sense 
that it is unlikely that they will produce any guidance in the foreseeable future regarding blockchains, cryptocurrencies, and any other related data protection in this area. But on the other hand, uh, the guidelines for internet use in Brazil assigns the duty of confidentiality of information to internet providers. This guarantee can only be bypassed by a court order and when there is a suspicion of illegal actions and it is necessary to identify those responsible. Taking all these guidelines into consideration, uh, it could be suggested that Brazil is kind of promoting the decentralized aspect of the blockchain by maintaining the anonymity of the blockchain users or miners and just revealing this information when there is a suspicion of illegal activity. But it, this is all conjecture, this is not uh, anything regulated uh, right now. And like most jurisdictions, there is no existence uh, existing guidance right now and I don't see the introduction of any in the foreseeable future here in Brazil. I mean, I'd, I'd echo some of those points in relation to uh, Australia. Um, it's, it's an area where, uh, you know, the, the connection between sort of blockchain and, and you know, the implications for, for privacy regulation have, have really not been um, explored uh, and, and not been even the subject of, you know, policy discussion. You know, policy discussion in Australia has focused on regulating um, digital currency exchanges um, and, and custody service providers. Um, that, that's, that's really been the, the focus. Um, and we're not there yet on that. Um, you know, we've, we've recently had a change of federal government um, who have delayed the, the process of, of regulating cryptocurrency exchanges. Um, and, and so we're unlikely to see regulation in that context for another year or so. Um, that's, that, I think, has still been the, the focus, I, I think, of, of discussions. And so um, privacy is, is not something that is in the uh, the, the minds um, of, of most policymakers at the moment. The, the only exception to that um, is that we saw the Australian regulator, um, it's called the Office of the Australian Information Commission. Um, they're the independent federal regulator. Um, they came out in 2019 with um, you know, what I call the, the cartel of other um, regulators uh, around the world in uh, expressing their uh, disapproval of um, Facebook now Meta's um, Libra um, proposal. Um, so it's, it's not like they've said um, completely nothing, but that is the only, only real um, time that it has come uh, into frame. I, mean, I, I can jump in here too. So um, in the US, and we'll, we're going to talk a little bit more about this later, but there's not guidance with respect to the data protection aspects, specifically um, in blockchain. There are initiatives and task forces that have started to form and express things like, you know, privacy is important and when the record is, you know, permanent, that makes things hard, <laughs> but without really specific. I mean, what I think is, you know, just generally speaking, and, and like Julia said, um, so we have had under the new, first of all, I don't think there have been too many public implementations where there was cause to test the, uh, kind of soft uses, right? Like the privacy rights, kind of like GDPR in the blockchain. Um, so, so things like, I mean, things like a breach, if there is a breach, it would be handled like a breach. If it is a health information breach, it would be handled like a health information breach. Um, I think that the, the new obligations that are GDPR-like, you know, kind of rights of information, rights of access, right of deletion, data portability, those things are new for us. So we don't have enforcement 
concerning blockchain either where and we have more i don't know if like traditional things but you know uh, websites cookies things like that but i mean it stands to reason that the same analysis would if you are applying the business third party or controller processor standard to a third party tracker on your website I mean, it stands to reason that you would do the same thing with respect to the different uh, actors operating the blockchain. Yeah, so I'll jump in here. So pertaining to Singapore, I think uh, it's quite similar to the rest of the countries. So I think we don't have specific uh, regulations, uh, uh, you know, um, in terms of um, uh, data privacy vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, permissionless blockchain networks, right? Uh, but I think um, besides that, I think just like what I've said earlier, I think from the company angle, you have to comp comply with uh, PDPA, which is appointing a data protection officer. And in fact, uh, if you were to operate in the banking sector, uh, we have something called the technology risk man management uh, framework. And under section 11.1, uh, there is a specific section that covers data address, data in motion, and data in use. Uh, that sets out, uh, you know, the guidelines in terms of how you can secure some of the data that you use or process in house, right? So, so that's on TRM. Um, and the final point I want to make is that uh, for crypto exchanges uh, or VAS uh, virtual asset service providers. Uh, in fact, Singapore is one of the earliest to adopt the FedEx guidelines. Uh, we are supposed to share data with respective um, uh, VAS, uh, but how that will translate to data privacy and things like that, I think that's uh, uh, remain to be seen. Yeah. Thanks. Um, perspective uh, from China. So uh, in China, we do have several specific regulations on blockchain, but not on data privacy. So um, the general uh, rule is that the, the common law regulating data privacy should be applicable to uh, blockchain. However, in terms of public blockchain, um, one need to bear in mind that in China, we don't permit permissionless public blockchain. Actually, uh, under the blockchain information service regulation, um, the, uh, and, uh, an operator needs to um, verify the the identity of users. So, um, so uh, you commonly you do that by having the ID numbers or mobile numbers of the users uh, if they are individual. And again, as I said, the dominant underlying rationale in China uh, in this territory is national security and public order, and. Uh, um, on the blockchain, um, it is those who operate the nodes to the blockchain and those who process personal information that are regulated. So um, let's take an, an example, um, uh, a blockchain with financial related distributed uh, ledger functions. So you usually you have financial uh, distributed uh, ledger operators, which will be regarded as network operators. Then they should be responsible for the cyber security, network security, information security, and so on. And you also have those, those uh, you know, um, tech, technical service providers which build the financial distributed ledger system. They are not regularly, you know, responsible for data privacy on the website. And the, 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 the regulation is, really centric to network operators and the data processors. So, so I'll add one more thing in the US. Uh, so privacy, we don't really have good guidance on, but here is what we do have. We do have um, indication by the CFPB, which is the regulator regulating financial institutions that they will take an expansive view of their authority and take action against companies in the blockchain space, specifically crypto companies, for unfair, deceptive, or abusive acts or practices, which is their, you know, their uh, mandate. 
Um, and the other thing that I would add is that there are a number of either guidance or regulation um, regulating blockchain specifically in the context of cryptocurrency and regulation of cryptocurrency and you know uh, on, on the, the security side. So that part's pretty well developed on the privacy side. Uh, it, we need to wait and see a little bit more. Let me perhaps from the European perspective um, also j just start with a, with, a, with a general notion that even if we, if we restrict ourselves to public permissionless blockchains, there are so many variations in that. Um, it, like th there may be small differences in how the network operates and functions that actually makes it very difficult to, uh, to come to a common standard and even not just define roles or, or, or define other perspectives on public permissionless blockchain networks in, in general. So I think in the end, it always comes down to a case by case analysis uh, and, and looking deeply in you know, what kind of processing instructions are there from one party to another who actually defines the means and purposes, which is important under the GDPR. Um, ha having said that, uh, there there is there is some guidance out there. Um, we're, we're hoping and waiting for it for more guidance as uh, privacy or blockchain privacy community i'd say for quite a while but uh, but the piece that's out there is from the CNIL, the french regulator which is uh, about four years old right now and personally i do take it with a grain of salt um, there's uh, like blockchain networks evolved interpretation of of uh, gdpr evolved so but it's 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 also at the same time the best thing we have at the moment right um Looking at that guidance, uh, which can be downloaded from the CNIL website if anyone is interested, um, it, it's in, in, in English even, um, which is great. I think there are three key takeaways. Um, one is that uh, participants in the network or in the public permissionless network um, can be seen as, as controllers if they have the right uh, to write and decide to send data into that blockchain. Um, then the uh, for for miners, um, which again is a concept that is very different uh, on a, on a per blockchain network. I think there are two different notions. One is is if they're just mining on their own behalf, uh, processing transactions, they do not have a role. Um, but if they do mine on behalf of someone else, um, that that uh, it will quite likely be a processing role. And the same probably counts for, uh, they even mentioned smart contracts developers uh, that have a role um, if, you know, as a as an organization, you do carry out processing on a blockchain on behalf of another organization. Uh, this is also to be seen as, as processes. I find that a more difficult one to interpret and to work with. Um, and and uh, also because the definition is a little um vague here I, I i have to say what are smart contract developers in this sense are, are we talking about developers or operators um and i think that the third takeaway is that uh and, and i think that's a strong point to be made um is that if multiple participants in a network jointly decide about how data is being processed that they should actually also be seen as joint controller um in the interpretation of the gdpr and that is therefore um in, in in such a network recommended to to basically make sure that um that there's one party that is approachable for questions or for or for any feedback and perhaps even does the decision making to make sure that there's only one key controller in that network instead of multiple joint controllers which which makes it very hard to um to address and to interpret in a public permissionless perhaps worldwide network Yes, indeed, uh, Sylvan. And uh, I mean, like you say, the CNIL guidelines are to take with a grain of salt, but uh, it's still the best uh, guidelines we have for the EU area. And talking about that, um, you were mentioning that all the blockchain privacy community is expecting some guidelines by the European regulator, which is the EDPB, uh, European Data Protection Board. Uh, do we have any updates on that particular file? No, no. I think I think the last time I had concrete information about that was unfortunately back in 2019, even um, when we had conversations with the 
um, with, the, with the Spanish regulators um, who were leading or collaborating on this effort. Um, it, it is supposed to be still in the work program, um, I believe, for this year, but uh, they are, they're not very um, open about what will be addressed, how it will be prioritized, uh, unfortunately. And, and as we also see, some of these priorities uh, could shift from time to time. But I think I think that EU-wide um, guideline from the from the EDPB would be would be one one of the most interesting things for us to uh, to wait for. Yes, uh, indeed. I mean, at the, in the privacy working group, we are waiting, as I'm sure all our experts are waiting. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, so from my understanding, uh, we don't have a lot of guidelines. We don't have a lot of specific regulation about blockchain and data privacy. So most of the experts here are uh, either uh, lawyers, either consultants, or you are in your daily job advising companies. Uh, what do you advise uh, to your clients when it comes to uh, blockchain, especially public permissionless blockchain and uh, data protection compliance? Uh, what is the best um, advice you can give? I mean, I can start and see how close, you know, the, the best practices for the U.S. parallel the European and other places. I mean, the first thing is, first of all, under the new U.S. laws, as well as FTC, you need to uh, have data minimization. So you need to, first of all, think, do I really need to collect it, right? With blockchain, with it being, you know, permanent, that's an even more, you know, important decision. But the first thing is, as with respect to the, to the identify of inf identifying information, right? Do I need this information? Is there a way to collect information which isn't identified as a way to anonymize it, to pseudonymize it, whatever, right? Like the first thing is, you know, do I need to collect it? And the second thing is, um, you know, uh, other pieces is like, what do I need to do with it? And is it possible to, for some of the things, especially the things that are going to be more problematic in connection with deletion, um, can you store them off chain as opposed to not and, and get, you know, more flexibility uh, that way? So, and then of course, the other pieces, which are sort of, you know, semi-related is same as GDPR. We have this, the concepts of purpose limitation and purpose specification. And therefore that isn't with respect to the storage, but with respect to the use, right? You need a robust privacy disclosure with respect to it. You need to specify what purposes um, you're using the information for and how. You need to specify with whom you're sharing it. Um, under CCPA, you also need to figure out whether, depending on what's going on in the chain, are you sharing it with a third party that is uh, where the sharing could be a sale, meaning you're sharing it with a third party for its own purposes, therefore, you would need to operationalize an opt out, which again, would be easier if the information was off chain. And then of course, secondary uses, we now have in at least California and Colorado, the GDPR um, test of compatible purpose, incompatible purpose. So if you are, you know, wanting to do a secondary use, you need to either think about it in advance or, you know, get for us its consent. Um, same as with the GDPR, you need to refresh your legal basis. So basically, first, the, 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 the takeaway is just treat the information as you would treat any personal information and do all of the things you need to do, but with a you know, the added issue where if you don't store it off chain, you have, you know, permanence problems. So you have to take that into consideration. I'll jump in. Uh, normally, uh, for being in compliance with the Brazilian data privacy laws, obtaining consent from the data subject would be the obvious, obvious advice and the easier way to say client, whoa, go ahead. But this isn't always possible and there are some alternative routes provided by the LEGPD, uh, such as compliance with the law, necessity because of a contract obligation, and for valid reasons, uh, unless this outweighed by the individual rights and interests. 
going through your specific question on public and private blockchains regarding public blockchains we would also advise to follow of course the relevant regulations with the LEGPD and as far as possible and where necessary or possible consider as Oria said anonymizing the person and only store the strictly necessary data. However, when we think about the private blockchain, it is important to think uh, about, uh, about the, the exceptions of LGPD and the law and not only work with the, the consent. If you are using the private blockchain for payroll of a company, for example, you wouldn't need a consent uh, because this would fall under the exception of a legal requirement. So the company would be contractually obliged to pay the employee and having the data on the private blockchain would be necessary to comply with payment obligations. So there are some ex ex exceptions and we should be looking into this. Uh, of course, always thinking beyond the consent is important and having legal professionals working in this analysis for sure is, is a must. I think um, it goes without saying that on, um, on blockchain, you need to follow all the data privacy related rules. Um, uh, and uh, the, the tricky part, the tricky thing on, on blockchain is that actually every blockchain could be regarded as an enlarger of privacy ris risks. And if you, if the blockchain travels from one jurisdiction to another, it, it will definitely make things more complicated. What I would say is that we try to minimize, minimize, and minimize. We minimize the role of the operators. So if we can be a technology service provider, don't go to make yourself an, a network operator. And, if, and then uh, we minimize uh, data collection. So try not to collect information which, would not, which are not necessary for the business. And we also minimize transfer of data to the blockchain. So if we can just, uh, you know, uh, if it is sufficient to keep the data uh, in a particular node, then that's it. I would probably jump into that and uh, mention that uh, privacy by design as a concept is something that should be considered in particular when using blockchain. Um, uh, blockchain is an immutable ledger by design and uh, everything that you that you put in there in particular public permissionless will be on there and out there forever spread across many nodes so privacy by design thinking about it from the from the very very beginning understanding your privacy risks and and adequately mitigating them is uh, is is a very important um, best practice in in this regard. Other than that, I would I would mention, for example, a zero knowledge proof as a as a technology to be further explored or to to be to be used um, potentially. Uh, and 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 there are not too many practical applications of this at the moment. Um, but but this is. Um, uh, technology that that could be further explored to to minimize privacy risks and and maximize compliance, um, and in, in indeed minimizing data. And I, I don't want to be repetitive here, but really only storing what is needed on chain. Move everything else off chain and, and store the anchor or hash on on chain so that you can that you keep the proof but not the data on chain and in a similar way also layer two protocols can be used um, so you may be able to only store the, the, the proof of the existence of the data on a main blockchain and keep everything else on a layer two chain um, those those would probably be my my recommended uh, best practices in in that regard I think touching yeah. on that that zero knowledge proofs, and I've I've seen that in the chat um, as as well. We've got a question on that, and we can perhaps come back to the <clears throat> specific question um, in in due course. But um, I, I guess take the opportunity to sort of flip the question on its head, and and I I, I think some, sometimes we think about well, um, what are the privacy obligations that we might have, uh, you know, with with data storing on chain, but 
we, we can flip it around in, in the sense that, well, how can we use this technology to actually um, improve privacy protections um, for people in a whole raft of, of other applications? And, you know, zero knowledge proofs are, are something that is, uh, at, at the moment, um, I, I don't think we're there yet in, in terms of the, the technology and, and the applications, but, but it's certainly in, in theory um, uh, got a huge potential in terms of um, traditional uh, data. Um, you know, a range of organizations collect um, way more data than they, than they need to because they think that they have to in order to comply with various you know, sort of regulatory um, processes. Uh, and, and yet, if you had something where, um, uh, whether it was a, a smart contracting platform or, or, or something like that, where you could connect into uh, and ask a question um, and, and get sort of a yes or no response, and that would satisfy uh, the, the regulatory sort of checkbox, um, that would be a much better system. And, and so um, I, I think there are, uh, there, there are benefits in not just a, a, a sort of a blockchain, but, but the wider ecosystem, the, the functionality, smart contracts and, and, and so on for privacy enhancing um, rather than seeing, you know, public blockchains as, as um, uh, you know, a, a big privacy risk. Yeah, just, just to add on to what Aaron just said, I think um, we have seen that uh, blockchain essentially is a state machine, right? So essentially it records all um, what's happening at, at, at a point in time. Uh, another thing that is being used right now, obviously, is oracles, right? Uh, data which is stored off-chain. I think that that possibly might be a better way of managing your privacy in addition to obviously your L2s, which uh, Sylvan has just mentioned, uh, and the zero knowledge proof that uh, Aaron has mentioned as well. So thanks to all the experts for all this best practice. I think we have a range of options available and uh, uh, do not hesitate to, to reach out uh, directly to uh, all the experts mentioned here today. I think they are uh, full of uh, great idea and solutions, uh, even if nothing is for sure. So we are running a bit late and I really want to, to allow uh, some time for um, audience question, but before we do so, um, and it's kind of related as well to some question in the audience uh, about DAO, our Decentralized Autonomous Organization. Uh, my question is about international data transfer. Uh, and it will be more a debate between um, the experts, I think, uh, because if you want, let, let, for instance, in the EU, if I want to transfer data about the EU citizen, uh, or residents, uh, I need to make sure outside the EU area, I want to make sure that the transfer happens uh, in a country presenting appropriate safeguards or appropriate level of protection. Uh, and you have restriction on international trans data transfer in most of the jurisdiction uh, of the experts at the table today. And so, you know, it's a very important question because in the blockchain, miners, validators will be located in many, many different areas of the globe. And so how can we solve uh, this international transfer compliance issue uh, that will happen on a daily basis, let's say also in their own and other uh, organization based on blockchain? So it's an open debate, so, you know. <laughs> Um, I will jump in um, on the subject. I think uh, eventually, um, no matter how wishful we could be, eventually it's a clash of titans and the uh, civilian nations will not, you know, uh, leave their cyberspace to other countries. And I think um, the, the gravity of, you know, the location of data subjects is not really an ideal solution. You can imagine that uh, China and India, you know, the two most populous countries could have a, a large voice um, in this context, contest, but um, that may not be, may not uh, fit in the overall, you know, uh, governance needs of many other nations. 
I'll jump in, and, and that's the million dollar question, I think, <laughs> because uh, at my perspective, once the data or information is on a public blo blockchain, it is essentially has been transferred internationally. So compliance with international transfers uh, legislations provided by the LEGPD needs to happen before any information is on the blockchain. So the way I see, well, um, the, the best way in my perspective is to obtain consent uh, from data subject before the information is disclosed, maybe by the terms and conditions uh, for use of the platform or, or, or any kind of document. Uh, these, uh, basing our analysis on the LGPD could protect uh, clients and, and blockchain providers against many of the compliance problems we face here in Brazil. From a European perspective, I would say that consent is more problematic than, than solving a problem. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, because consent can be revoked and then it's on a public permissionless ledger. And, and that is one of the problems that we struggle with quite a bit. It may be uh, also different in, in different uh, jurisdictions as, as to how that, how that works. Um, but, but and, 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 and I don't have a good solution. To that. Like, I think this is all very hypothetical. It's indeed a million dollar question, right? Um, but there, there are some conceptual ideas, um, and and one of the one of the most fascinating ones that I heard and have been debating um, actually quite a while ago, is uh, if 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 you can have some um, uh, sorry, I'm I'm not sure if that ex exactly solves the international transfer problem, but I'll get to that in a bit. But if you can get nodes to agree to certain conditions um, before they uh, before they join the network, uh, let them uh, sign a smart contract um, if that could be at some point a legal instrument, um, and perhaps in certain jurisdictions it may already be a legal instrument. Um, then agree to a certain contract and and what i'm aiming at is is a concept again very conceptual of of binding network rules or a certain kind of like binding corporate rules then applying to a network instead of a group of corporates again very exploratory it's not something that is an instrument at the moment but more like a very hypothetical idea of how, of how these things may be solvable at some point in the future i see that also some again then you venture a little bit away from the public permissionless network but um what if you only allow nodes within a certain jurisdiction that's what some net networks do as well but then of course that's no longer public permissionless because public permissionless means that it's not only for the participants to freely participate but also for the nodes and miners and everything else so very interesting um, event for uh, binding mining rules. I like it, you know. <laughs> um, unfortunately, one of our experts, Odia, had to leave a bit early today uh, due to uh, pr uh, prior engagements. Um, I'm gonna uh, put her LinkedIn uh, in the in the in the chat. But please continue. This was very interesting uh, conversation, uh, and I like the idea of binding mining rules again. Uh, I was just gonna jump in and again, kind of you know, flip the flip the question, and and I. I I think often we're, um, you know, we, we get into this trap where, you know, we say, well, how do we, how do we need to sort of um, uh, alter, you know, blockchain practices to, to fit in with, you know, whatever regulation? Well, here's the thing, the regulations can change, right? So I, I think where something just doesn't make sense, um, I, I think there should be an effort from the industry um, to put forward a convincing case um, to, to whoever it might be, whatever legislative body it is, to say, hey, in this context, these privacy regulations don't make sense, right? Now, uh, the, 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 the idea of the right to, right to be forgotten doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me as a, an Australian. Uh, it's not, not something we, we have. Um, but I tell you what, on, a, on a, an immutable sort of ledger, uh, it makes zero sense at all. Um, and, and so, um, you know, the, the, I think there needs to be some scope for looking at, well, uh, are there exemptions? 
that are there carve outs that should apply when we're dealing with public open source blockchains? Because um, you know, the, the way that information is being generated uh, in, in that context is, is by users interacting with, with those protocols um, d- directly. And I, I think that's, that's an important part about what data is. It's always co-created in some sort of way. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I think that's something that can be, be looked at. In terms of the international data transfer, I think Julia's right. As soon as, as, soon as that goes on, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, it's, it's out there. It's, it's been transferred internationally. Now, that's, that's on most networks. Of course, there are going to be uh, exceptions to that. And so, well, what are the implications of that? Well, in terms of the GDPR, and I'm, I'm no expert on the GDPR. I'll be the first to say that. Um, uh, what I would would say though is I, I know the extraterritorial aspect of the GDPR is insane. Um, if you are at the other end of the earth and you think about a European customer, you, you are you are bound by that uh, that that regulation already. Um, now I'm being a bit flippant, of course, but uh, I think these these are some of the things that I think we need to think about in terms of law reform. Um, not necessarily how can we change the blockchain to, to fit the, the regulations. The regulations are perfect. How, how can we change the regulations to fit, you know, this, this kind of new technology? Is a discussion worth having? Yeah, I, I'm a little bit more optimistic in, in, in how um, things are panning out in terms of the technology because um, let me give you an example, right? So if you're talking about, uh, let's say, NFTs, right? So um, there have been cases where, you know, there are scammers and, and people are tricked into transferring or signing some of these uh, smart contracts and, and some of the NFTs are transferred out without their permission. And not too long ago, I saw someone working on a revocable smart contract where there is like a stop, uh, uh, I guess, intermediary stop where, you know, you can um, request for certain NFTs to be revoked uh, in terms of the permission, right? So if you extrapolate this example to towards uh, um, um, data transfers and things like that, uh, perhaps, you know, sometime, you know, in the future, we can have smart contracts that then look at, you know, uh, revoking some of this access to, to data or, or something like that. So I think that will happen. Um, and it is through all these, uh, um, I guess experimentations that, that you know things get uh, hammered out and, and and worked on. So yeah, and not and, and not to mention uh, also um, you know there are certain uh, Ethereum uh, protocols um, as in the the standards uh, we have ERC twenty and so and so forth. Um, there are other standards being being worked on, uh, and that potentially could be you know the solution to to some of these uh, questions. Yeah. So thank you very much. Uh, Unless uh, anyone wants to add something on this very, very interesting topic of international data transfer, uh, I propose to move to questions from the audience because we have plenty of these and actually very interesting ones. Um, So one of the questions that came back multiple times was uh, what constitutes a personal information or personal data uh, on a blockchain? Is that uh, different? Uh, Can we talk about maybe public keys? Um, so what is the personal data on the blockchain? Well, I mean, the, the answer to every legal question is it depends, right? Um, and so, um, uh, you know, d- does it depend on what the legislation says or does it depend on what we think it should say? Um, you know, those are other questions. I mean, look, in the Australian context, I, I think that the key part of uh, the, the definition of personal information is is the words reasonably identifiable. Um, so either either identifiable or, or or reasonably identifiable from from the data. Uh, and so um, where you've got um, some other record that you can link up with, you know, with with this blockchain record, whether it's the where it's a, a, a wallet address or a or an account or whatever it might be, um, that's the point, at least on Australian law, that it would become uh, you know, this, this personal information. But I'm, I'm sure in other jurisdictions, it might be slightly different. 
Well, the the GDPR defines um, uh, personal data as as information um, that that tells something about or helps identify uh, a data subject or a natural person. Um, so if we if we transfer that concept into uh, or the definition into the world of blockchain uh, and for example look at a, um, a public key or wallet address, um, then the answer to that question like like if if that is personal information is is probably dependent on the on the perspective. Do I have enough information to make that link between this this wallet address and a natural person? And probably if I put myself in the shoes of a cryptocurrency exchange that has like KYC requirements, I have to go through like for everyone that uh, that 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 signs up with me, I need to go through KYC. So I have their personal information. I also see what um, what their wallet addresses are or what what wallet addresses they are interacting with. And from that perspective, I can I can probably identify who's behind that wallet address from that perspective. Um, from other perspectives, probably not right away or not immediately and if we stick with the example of 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 wallet addresses uh, but more from a public perspective in particular these um these analysis um or investigation tools like chain analysis etc um they collect a lot of information and there's so much behavioral data um, that they are collecting that that with some level of certainty people can be identified if perhaps not today then then tomorrow um, just by their behavior and other points of interaction. And that then from the point of view of the GDPR would make it personal data. So um, to go with the, with the concept of better safe than sorry, I think, I think it's safe to assume that that constitutes personal data in most cases. I mean, that's fascinating, yeah. um, Zorban, because, uh, you know, so some of those, you know, the connections that, um, those analytics companies are making between different uh, wallets uh, are based not on, uh, you know, are based partially on obviously people's transactions that they are making, um, but also on, you know, quite complex algorithms that they are running, you know, kind of over the over the, the top of these things, and so um, they're they're effectively producing that personal information in 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 some sort of some way which i think is fascinating right right absolutely agree i would like to add that um it seems that whether to, to decide whether a particular information or uh, a person is identifiable we need to follow some objective standards so um because even a particular you know data processor or network operator doesn't have intention or capability to do that job if you are storing that inf uh, the information on on in, on your control and then it may pass to another person or to a public blockchain, then some more others may have that capability. So I think to ensure the level of protection, it we we have to follow an objective standard um, uh, on on the entire cyberspace. I'll jump in. Uh, it's just interesting thinking about this subject because in Brazil, although our country is heavily regulated, it's a heavily regulated uh, jurisdiction in general, it is usually a little slower to implement uh, laws or guidance for technologies. And right now we are beginning thinking about crypto assets, but we are not talking about the blockchain technology or even privacy relating to, to blockchain. So we have to pick the definition from the LGPD, which is similar to the GDPR. And so I'll follow Sylvan uh, and the thoughts he just brought to us. Um, yeah, so Singapore has a lot of um, regulations or at least guidelines for crypto assets. Um, as I've mentioned earlier, we followed very closely the FedEx guidelines. Uh, so that, that refers to some of the crypto exchanges and also the, uh, the virtual asset service providers. Uh, that's, that's one. Uh, but uh, I would say, um, coming back to the question on um, what is identifiable information, I think uh, it's the same, right? As long as um, you regulate the service providers, I think 
um, what remains on the, the the chain itself, then you can leave it to the technology to 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 work on the L twos and and whatnot. Yeah. So thank you for all of these comments. I think it's uh, making it a bit clearer that um, you know most data on the blockchain will qualify as personal data depending on the on the area of the world. But for the GDPR, it's clear. In Brazil, it's clear. Um, what one of the questions I thought very interesting was about um, the right to be forgotten uh, in, in blockchain. And it's often described as one of the big conflict between blockchain technology, its mutability, and the implementation of right to be forgotten when you have one in your jurisdiction. Not every jurisdiction has a right to be forgotten. Uh, it's important to note. But what was suggested by Irina was actually to apply blockchain analytic tools uh, in relation uh, to the blockchain address to implement the right to be forgotten. So any thoughts on that? Well, a, a concept that I've heard of before, um, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how, like for, for me, block, blockchain analytics to, analytic tools um, are rather harming privacy and collecting more or generating more data than, than the other way around. But one, one thing, one concept that could be applied is to basically um implement a filter of some kind and probably not only with with blockchain uh, analytics companies but also with every node or any exchange or everything there so basically if if all the nodes or all the actors on the blockchain network would simply filter out that information or not display it anymore i find it a bit of a bolt on top makeshift solution uh, it's not ideal but but you could go that way to to you know do something and 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 have some level of uh, forgetfulness on the blockchain. Well, I'll jump in. Uh, there, there are strong discussions here in Brazil about the right to be forgotten, especially relating to the nomenclature itself. Uh, there is a lot of doctrine, jurisprudential discussions but we still do not have any something positive or consensual here in Brazil. But when we talk about blockchain, there are some we call impasses or, or, or problems that we should face because the LGPD says that the data subject uh, has the right to request the data to be erased or deleted. Uh, so even though we have not expressed a right to be forgotten in Brazil, uh, the right to elimination of data provided by the LEDPD. And this is a really sensitive discussion here in Brazil when we talk about the, the blockchain technology. I mean, as, as I've said before, I mean, the, the right to be forgotten doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. But um, what, what I would say is that um, users now have uh, a huge amount of power over their anonymity that you know that they really have not had previously. Um, you know, if if you want to set up a new bank account, well, you've got to go somewhere, um, provide that bank with all your identification documents, and you know, access to your you know government records and and and, and so on. Um, it is trivially easy to generate a new address. Um, it is trivially easy to use uh, other tools to um, really ge generate, um, uh, you know, new new wallets um, and, uh, and 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 those sorts of things. So the 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 way that you can kind of delete your on-chain history um, could be as simple as. Uh, stop using those those addresses, uh, and and to generate uh, generate new ones. And in, and indeed, uh, a, a lot of people um, in the crypto space do this very regularly, um, and and they're using fresh addresses for for fresh transactions um, in order to uh, to preserve that that privacy. Um, there, there are discussions at the moment um, in in the US context. Uh, about um, you know tornado cash and, and the, those other sort of mixing and and and, and tumblers and and so on, 
uh, and the legitimacy or otherwise of, of using those sorts of tools. But um, you know, so it, it it it's it's an interesting um, sort of parallel here that you know on on one hand um, you know we're concerned about privacy, we want to protect privacy, and yet when we've got these privacy pre preserving tools, we've actually got government regulators putting these tools on, on sanction lists that are usually reserved for, you know, rogue states and, and, and drug cartels. So it, it's, it's quite an interesting, um, you know, kind of conflict there, I think. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I don't know what the answer is necessarily, but um, uh, again, you know, to be optimistic about the technology, um, you know, users have way more control about how they how they're using it, how they're interacting with it um, than than they ever could previously. Now that's that's a crypto centric sort of view of blockchain, and I obviously understand that blockchain applications are broader than than just that. But I, I think it's a nice start. Can, can I, I would just like quickly to... jump in here? Sorry. Thanks, please go yeah, ahead. Yeah. So. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So. So I think if you. I think this, this is just, uh, you know, something that I just thought of, right? So if you look at the way NFTs are, are, are designed, NFTs is nothing more than just a pointer to a file, right? So you don't really store the, the image on the blockchain. So effectively, what we're saying is that uh, you can actually store your personal data off chain, right? To an IPFS or, or, um, or another uh, story system. And then it's just a pointer, right? So you can just change the data on the IPFS without, uh, you know, uh, revealing much of the information. I mean, this is just one example, right? And 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 there are cases where you know NFT projects has has actually, you know, replace some of the images with with something else, right? So I think this is just just another example. Yeah. Sorry, Ko. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, good point. Yeah. Uh, I just want to. Uh, I just uh, uh, would like to to add that. Um, the need to be able to delete that information is is not only relevant um, in the uh, right to be forgotten context. It could be relevant in many other contexts where there is a strong, you know, public uh, policy concern or a private interest concern. So we can imagine that if it matters, not uh, if if the, the issue is about, for example, porn, uh, child uh, pornography, then even the individual or its custody doesn't claim um, uh, the right to be forgotten. You still, there is still a, a prevailing need to um, delete such information. Uh, so to, 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 protect, uh, to not only to pr protect certain persons, but also to maintain a good order over the cyberspace. So I think um, in China, the, the overall, uh, I think the governance um, the, the, the overall design is that those nodes shall be held responsible to uh, as ports to the information. And if the, the website uh, or the blockchain could not provide a sound structure for, for, for controlling such information, then it would not be permitted to put it into use. Well, um, thank you very much for all of these great comments, remarks. Um, I mean, there are still a lot to do uh, in our industry, right? And uh, I think it's time to, to wrap it up. Um, so I will, unfortunately, Odia left us, but I will ask uh, uh, all the experts maybe for a last word or comment. Um, but uh, yeah, I really want to thank you for attending, uh, for people in the audience. Thanks to our experts for all the great um, point that were made and discussion that were made uh, and uh, contributing to the report as well, because without you, the report won't exist. Uh, and thank you as well to the INADBA Privacy Working Group for all the hard work. Um, about, um, talking about that, we are going to organize a series of uh, webinar uh, coming soon about uh, privacy and blockchain, especially about ZKP encryption and other uh, and privacy and anti technologies that were mentioned uh, today. So. Last word for our experts, and then it's time to, to say goodbye. Thank you.
I think I'll I'll close with uh, with saying that we shouldn't forget that both areas are still uh, still evolving, mostly blockchain and and technology, right? Um, but also what uh, what Aaron rightfully mentioned that the law should also um, evolve and and um, the guidance uh, will probably also help us um, going further. But uh, it's a it's a topic that we need to keep revisiting to um, to stay on top of it and. and with that, thank you to everyone. Uh, it's a great panel. Thank you so much. Yeah, it, it's been terrific. I mean, uh, as I said at the outset, I, I think this is an area where um, I, I don't think has received actually a lot of attention. Um, and I, I think it's great um, that, you know, th this forum um, is, is really coming together to, to put some minds um, you know, to that task, um, uh, I, I think that you know we're, we're we're not yet we're not there yet, but we've made a start and we've made a good start. And so, yeah, it's it's been great to have that that um, that beginning of the discussion. I think, and and looking forward to where where it ends up. I'll jump in. Uh, well, as I mentioned, uh, current data protection laws here in Brazil have not considered decentralized technology and the whole Web3 ecosystem. Uh, and we have no regulations on blockchain yet. However, we we have been working with crypto assets and we and the Brazilian equivalent of SEC has been issuing regulations uh, regarding crypto assets. And although this does not specifically consider data protection, it clearly demonstrates that regulation of crypto assets and the Web3 and blockchain is something that is being addressed and will be addressed uh, soon here in Brazil. So I'd like to thank my colleagues, Natba, Paula, and all the audience for this important debate. As Aaron said, we, we need to discuss uh, blockchain and all these technologies for uh, having a, be a, a, a best technology for everybody. And that's it. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, for me, I think uh, in terms of uh, regulations, I think um, regulations should uh, support innovation and technology. So I'm very optimistic uh, in terms of some of the developments in, in this space. Um, yeah, so this, this is just a start, right? I think we are just barely stretching the surface like, like some of the panelists have, have mentioned, um, but uh, regulations should not stifle innovation and, and I hope uh, it remains to be so. Well, I, I would like to add some um, maybe not that favorable um, comments uh, from China. Well, um, the Chinese government basically uh, wiped out the entire cryptocurrency uh, industry from China, and uh, we are not, no longer in that conversation. And uh, uh, it seems to me that, um, uh, well, I would say I'm convicted that the blockchain industry is likely to be, to see more governmental uh, uh, intervention. And I think that's where we, the value of um, Inatba um, can be seen that we are trying to provide guidelines or soft laws on, on self-regulation or regulation of the industry of the blockchain technology in the new uh, frontiers. And uh, we, with these, we can, without these sound structures, it, I think blockchain technology would would not be regarded as uh, a good thing, and uh, that's the the value of um, Inataba uh, and the, the the pioneering really uh, here really matters. Well, uh, this is the end of a great panel. Uh, we're six minutes late, so thanks for everyone that stayed until the end. Um, I'm looking forward for um, an event um, next year and also upcoming events with uh, the INADBA Privacy Working Group and other working group. Uh, thank you, everyone. Please don't hesitate to reach out to all the experts if you have like specific questions about uh, their jurisdiction. Um, you can also download the report on the website and, and read their great contribution. 
So thank you so much. And um, and yeah, have a great rest of your day all night for, you know, Singapore and China, I think, and Australia. I think yes. it's time for you guys to, <laughs> to in the in the bed. So bye. Thank you, everyone. And uh, thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Bye. bye. Thank bye. you. Thanks so much for putting it together. It's been great. Thank you for having Thank me. Bye-bye.